title of the reading, Conversion, a sermon number 45, delivered on Sabbath morning, October 7, 1855, by the Reverend C.H. Spurgeon at New Park Street Chapel, Southwark, read by Faith Alone. Every Creature Ministry, for more of our works, follow us on youtube.com forward slash c forward slash every creature ministry or t.me forward slash every creature ministry brethren if any of you do ear from the truth and one converted him let him know that he which convert sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from that and shall hide a multitude of sins james chapter 5 verse 19 to 20 the true believer is always pleased to hear of anything which concerns the salvation of his own soul he rejoiced to hear of the covenant plan drawn up from him from all eternity of the great fulfillment on the cross at calvary of all the stipulations of the savior of the application of them by the holy spirit of the security which the believer has in the person of christ and of those gifts and graces which accompany salvation to all those who are here thereof. But I feel certain that deeply pleased as we are when we hear of things touching our own salvation and deliverance from hell, we as preachers of God and as new creatures in Christ, being made like unto him, have true benevolence of spirit and therefore are always delighted when we hear, speak, or think concerning the salvation of others. Next to our own salvation, I am sure as a Christian, we shall always prize the salvation of other people. We shall always desire that what has been so sweet to our own taste may also be tasted by others, and what has been of so inestimable precious value to our own souls may also become the property of all those whom God may please to shall unto everlasting life. I am sure, beloved, now that I am about to preach concerning the conversion of the ungodly, you will take a deep and interest in it, as if it were something that immediately concerned your own souls. For after, after all, such were some of you once. You were unconverted and ungodly, and had not God take though for you and set his people to strive for your souls. Where have you been? Seek then to exercise that charity and benevolence towards others, which God and God's people first exercise towards you. Our text has in it, first of all, a principle involved that of instrumentality, brethren, if any of you do ear from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he who convert a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from that. Secondly, here is a general fact stated. He who convert a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. And thirdly, 
there is a particular application of this fact made. Brethren, if any of you do ear from the truth, and one converted him, that is the same principle as when a sinner is converted from the error of his way. First then, here is a great principle involved, a very important one, that of instrumentality. God had been pleased in his inseritable wisdom and intelligence to work the conversion of others by instrumentality. True, he does not in all cases do so, but it is his general way. Instrumentality is the plan of the universe. In the new creation, it is almost always God's invariable rule to convert by means of instruments. Now, we will make one or two brief remarks upon this principle. First then, we say that instrumentality is not necessary with God. God can, if He pleases, convert a soul without any instrument whatsoever. The mighty maker who chooses to use this word sometimes can, if He pleases, slay without it. He who uses the workman, the trowel, and the hammer can, if he sees fit, but build the house in a moment, and from the foundation stones, even to the top stone thereof, can complete it by the words of his own mouth. We never hear of any instrument used in the conversion of Abraham. He lived in a far off land in the midst of idolaters, but he was called Ar of the Chaldees, and thence God called him and brought to him by Canaan, by an immediate voice, doubtless from above, by God's own agency, without the employment of any prophet. For we read of none who could, as far as we can see, have preached to Abraham and taught him the truth. And in modern times, we have a mighty instance of the power of God in converting without human might. Saul, on his journey towards Damascus, upon his horse, fiery and full of fury against the children of God, is hastening to hail men and women and cast them into prison to bring them bound unto Jerusalem. But on a sudden, a voice is heard from heaven, Saul, Saul, why persecute Domi? And Saul was a new man. No minister was his spiritual parent. No book could claim him as its convert. No human voice but the immediate utterance of Jesus Christ himself at once, there and then, and upon the spot brought Saul to know the truth. Moreover, there are some men who seem never to need conversion at all. For we have one instance in scripture of John the Baptist, of whom it is said, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And I do not know but what there are some who very early in life have a change of heart. It is quite certain that all infants, who doubtless being each of them elect, do ascend in heaven, undergo a change of heart without instrumentality and so there may be some concerning whom it may be written that though they were bo born in sin and shapen in iniquity yet 
they were so early taught to know the Lord, so soon brought to His name, that it must have been almost without instrument at all. God can, if He pleases, cast the instrument aside. The mighty maker of the world, who used no angels to beat out the great mass of nature and fashion it into a round globe, He, who without hammer or anvil fashioned this glorious world, can, if He pleases, speak and it is done. Command, and it shall stand fast. He needs not instruments, though he uses them. Secondly, we make another remark, which is that instrumentality is very honorable to God and not dishonorable. One would think, perhaps at first sight, that it would reflect more glory to God if he effected all conversions himself without the use of men, but that is a great mistake. It is as honorable to God to convert by means of Christians and others as it would be if he should effect it alone. Suppose a workman has power and skill with his hands alone to fashion a certain article, but you put into his hands the worst of tools you can find. You know he can do it well with his hands, but these tools are so badly made that they will be the greatest impediment you could lay in his way. Well, now I say, If a man with these bad instruments or these poor tools, things without edges, that are broken, that are weak and frail, is able to make some beauteous fabric, he has more credit from the use of those tools than he would have if he had done it simply with his hands, because the tools so far from being an advantage were this were a disadvantage to him so far from being a help are of my supposition even a detriment to him in his work so with regard to human instrumentality so far from being any assistance to god we are all hindrances to him What is a minister? He is made by gods a means of salvation. But it is a wonderful thing that anyone so faulty, so imperfect, so little skilled, should yet be blessed of God to bringing forth children for the Lord Jesus. It seems as marvelous as if a man should fashion rain from fire, or if he should fabricate some precious alabaster vase out of the refuse of the dunghill. God, in his mercy, does more than make Christians without means. He takes bad means to make good men with, and so he even reflects credit on himself because his instrument are all of them such poor things. They are all such earthen vessels that they do but set off the glory of the gold which they hold, like the foil that set forth the jewel, or like the dark spot in the painting that makes the light more brilliant. And yet the dark spot and the foil are not in themselves costly or valuable. So God uses instrument to set forth his own glory and to exalt himself. This brings us to other remark that usually God does 
employ instruments, perhaps in one case out of a thousand. Men are converted by the immediate agency of God, and so indeed are all in one sense, but usually in 99 cases out of a hundred, God is pleased to use the instrumentality of his ministering servants, of his word, of Christian men, or some other means to bring us to the Savior. I have heard of some, I remember them now, who were called like Saul. At once from heaven, we can remember the history of the brother who in the darkness of the night was called to know the Savior by what he believed to be a vision from heaven or some effect on his imagination. On one side, he saw a black tablet of his guilt, and his soul was delighted to see Christ cast a white tablet over it. And he thought he heard a voice that said, I am he that blotted out thy transgression for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. There was a man converted almost without instrumentality. But you do not meet with such a case often. Most persons have been convinced by the pious conversation of sisters, by the holy examples of mothers, by the ministers, by the Sabbath school, or by the reading of tracts, or pursuing scripture. Let us not therefore believe that God will often work without instruments. Let us not sit down silently and say, God will do his own work. It is quite true he will. But then he does his works by using his children as instruments. He does not say to the Christian men, when he is converted, sit thee down. I have not for thee to do, but I will do all myself and have all the glory. No, he says, Thou art a poor weak instrument, thou can do nothing. But lo, I will strengthen thee, and I will make thee trush the mountains, and beat them small, and make the hills as chaff, and so shall I get more honor through thy having done it then I should had mine own strong arm smitten the mountains and broken them in pieces. Now, another thought, and that is, if God sees fit to make use of any of us for the conversion of others, we must not therefore be too sure that we are converted ourselves. It is almost solemn thought that God makes use of ungodly men as instruments for the conversion of sinners. And it is strange that some most terrible acts of wickedness have been the means of conversion of men. When Charles II ordered the Book of Sports to be read in churches, and after the service, the clergyman was required to read to all the people to spend the afternoon in what are called harmless diversions and games that I will not mention here. Even that was made the means of conversion, for one man said within himself, I have always disported myself, thus on the Sabbath day, but now to hear this read in church, how wicked we must have become, how the whole land must be corrupt, it led him to think of his own corruption and brought him to the Savior. There have been words proceeding 
I had almost said from devils, which have been the means of conversion. Grace is not spoiled by the rotten wooden spot it runs through. God did once speak by an ass to Balaam, but that did not spoil his words. So he speaks, not simply by an ass, which he often does, but by something worse than that. He can fill the mouths of ravens with food for an Elijah, and yet the raven is a raven still. We must not suppose, because God has made us useful, that we are therefore converted ourselves. But then, another thing. If God in His mercy does not make us useful to to the conversion of sinners, we are not therefore to say, we are sure we are not the children of God. I believe there are some ministers who have had the painful labor of toiling from year to year without seeing a single soul regenerated. Yet those men have been faithful to their charge and have well discharged their ministry. I do not say that such cases often occur, but I believe they have occurred sometimes. Yet, mark you, the end of their ministry has been answered after all. For what is the end of the gospel ministry? Some will say it is to convert sinners. That is a collateral end. Others will say it is to convert the saints. That is true. But the proper answer to give is, it is to glorify God. And God is glorified even in the damnation of sinners. If I testify to them the truth of God, and they reject His gospel, if I faithfully preach His truth, and they scorn it, my minister is not therefore void. It has not returned to God void, for even the punishment of those rebels, he will be glorified, even in their destruction, he will get himself honor. And if he cannot get praise from their songs, he will at last get honor from their condemnation and overthrow when he shall cast them into the fire forever. The true motive for which we should always labor is the glory of God in the conversion of souls and building up God's people. But let us never lose sight of the great end. Let God be glorified and he will be. If we preach his truth faithfully and honestly, so therefore while we should seek for souls, if God denies them unto us, let us not say, I will not have other mercies that he has given, but let us comfort ourselves with a thought, that thought they be not safe, though Israel be not gathered in. God will glorify and honor us at last. One thought more upon this subject. God, by using us an instrument, confers upon us the highest honor which men can receive. O beloved, I dare not dilate upon this. It should make our hearts burn at the thought of it. It makes us feel thrice honored that God should use us to convert souls, and it is only the grace of God which teaches us, on the other hand, that it is the grace and grace alone which makes us useful, which can keep us humble under the thought 
that we are bringing souls to the Savior. It is a work which he who has won and stirred God had blessed him cannot renounce. He will be impatient. He will long to win more souls to Jesus. He will account that. He will think that labor is but ease, so that by any means he may save some and bring men to Jesus. Glory and honor, praise and power be unto God that he does honor his people. But when he exalts us most, we will still conclude with, Not unto us, not unto us, but unto thy name be all the glory forever and ever. He who convert the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. The choicest happiness which mortal breast can know is the happiness of benevolence of doing good to our fellow creatures to save a body from death is that which gives us almost heaven on earth some men can boast that they have sent so many souls to pre perdition that they have have hurled many of their fellows out of the world we meet now and then a soldier who can glory that in battle he struck down so many foemen thus that his whip and cruel sword reach the heart of so many of his enemies but i count not that glory if i had thought i had been the means of death of a single individual methinks I should scare rest at night, for the uneasy ghost of that murdered wretch would stare me in mine eyes. I should remember I had slain him, and perhaps sent his soul unshaven and unwashed into the presence of his Maker. It seems to me wonderful that men can be bound to be soldiers. I say not if it be right or wrong. Still I wonder where they can find the men. I know not how after a battle they can wash their hands of blood, wipe their swords and put them by, and then lie down to slumber, and their dreams be undisturbed. Methinks the tears would not fall hot, and scalding on my cheek at night, and the shrieks of the dying, and the groans of those approaching eternity, would torture mine ear. I know not how others can endure it. To me, it would be the very portal of hell, if I could think I had been the destroyer of my fellow creature. But what bliss is it to be the instrument of saving bodies from death? Those monks on Mount St. Bernard surely must feel happiness when they rescue men from death. The dog comes to the door, and they know what it means. He has discovered some poor weary traveler who has lain him down to sleep in the snow and is dying from cold and exhaustion. Uprise the monks from their cheerful fire, intent to act the good Samaritan to the lost one. At last, they see him. They speak to him, but he answers not. They try to discover it. There is breath in his body, and they think he is dead. They take him up, give him remedies, and hastening to their hostel, they lay him by the fire and warm and chafe him, looking into his face with kindly anxiety, 
as much as to say, poor creature, or to that, when at last they perceive some heavenings of their lungs, what joy is in the breast of those brethren, as they say, his life is not extinct. Methinks if there could be happiness on earth, it would be the privilege to help to chafe one hand of that poor, almost dying man, and be the means of bringing him to life again. Or suppose another case, a house in is, is in flames, and in its woman with her children, who cannot by any means escape. In vain, she attempts to come downstairs. The flames prevent her. She has lost all presence of mind and know not how to act. The strong man comes and says, Make way, make way. I must save that woman. And cooled by the genial stream of benevolence, he marches through the fire. Though scorched and almost stifled, he gropes his way, he ascends one staircase, then another, and though the stair stutters, he places the woman beneath his arm, takes a child on his shoulder, and down he comes, twice a giant, having more might than he ever possessed before. He has jeopardized his life, and perhaps an arm may be disabled, or a limb taken away, or a sense lost, or an injury irretrievably done to his body. Yet he claps his hand and says, I have saved lives from death. The crowd in the street hail him as a man who has been the deliverer of his fellow creatures, honoring him more than the monarch who had stormed a city, sacked a town, and murdered myriads. But ah, Britain, the body which was saved from death today may die tomorrow. Not so the soul that is saved from death. It is saved everlastingly. It is saved beyond the fear of destruction. And if there be joy in the breast of a benevolent man, when he saves a body from death, how much more blessed must he be when he is made the means of the hand of God of saving a soul from death and hiding a multitude of sins Suppose that, by some conversation of yours, you are made the means of delivering a soul from death. My friends, you are apt to imagine that all the conversion is under God, done by the minister. You make a great mistake. There are many conversion effected by a very simple observation from the most humble individual. A single word spoken may be more the means of conversion than a whole sermon. There, you sit before me. I trust at you. But you are too far off. Some brother, however, addresses an observation to you. It is a very stab without a short point guard in your heart. God often blesses a short pity expression from a friend more than a long discourse from a minister. There was once in a village where there had been a revival in religion, a man who was a confirmed infidel, notwithstanding all the efforts of the minister and many Christian people. He had resisted all attempts and appeared to be more and more confirmed in his sin. At length, the people held a prayer meeting, specially to intercede for his soul. Afterwards, God put it into the heart 
of one of the elders of the church to spend a night in prayer in behalf of the four infidel. In the morning, the elder rose from his knees, saddled his horse, and rode down to man's smithy. He meant to say a great deal to him, but he simply went up to him, took him by the hand, and all he could say was, O oh, sir, I am deeply concerned for your salvation. I am deeply concerned for your salvation. I have been wrestling with God all this night for your salvation. He could say no more. His heart was too full. He then mounted on his horse and rode away again. Down went the blacksmith's hammer, and he went immediately to see his wife. She said, What is the matter with you? Matter enough, said the man. I have been attacked with a new argument this time. There is Elder B, has been here this morning, and he said, I am concerned about your salvation. Why now, if he is concerned about my salvation, it is a strange thing that I am not concerned about it. The man's heart was clean captured by that kind word from the elder. He took his own horse and rode to the elder's house. When he arrived there, the elder was in his parlor, still in prayer, and they knelt down together. God gave him a contrite spirit and a broken heart and brought that poor sinner to the feet of the Savior. There was a soul saved from death and a multitude of sins covered. Again, you may be the means of conversion by a letter you may write. Many of you have not the power to speak or say much, but when you sit down alone in your chamber, you are able with God's help, to write a letter to a dear friend of yours. Oh, I think that is a very sweet way to endeavor to be useful. I think I never felt so much earnest after the souls of my fellow creatures as when I first loved the Savior's name. And though I could not preach, I never thought I should be able to testify to the multitude. I used to write texts on little scraps of paper and drop them anywhere that some poor creatures might pick them up and receive them as message of mercy to their souls. There is your brother. He is careless and hardened. Sister, Sit down and write a letter to him. When he receives it, he will perhaps smile, but he will say, Ah, well, it is Betsy letter after all. And that will have some power. I knew a gentleman whose dear sister used often to write to him concerning his soul. I use, said he to stand with my back up against a lamp post, with a cigar in my mouth, perhaps at two o'clock in the morning, to read her letter. I always read them, and I have said, wept floods of tears after reading my sister's letters. Though I still keep on the error of my ways, they always check me, they always seem a hand pulling me away from sin, a voice crying out, Come back, come back. And at last, a letter from her in conjunction with a solemn providence was the means of breaking his heart, and he sought salvation through a Savior. Again, how many have been converted 
by the example of true Christians. Many of you feel that you cannot write or preach, and you think you can do nothing. Well, there is one thing you can do for your master. You can live Christianity. I think there are more people who look at the new life in Christian written out on you than they will in the old life that is written in the scriptures. An infidel will use arguments to disprove the Bible if you set it before him. But if you do to others as you would that they should do to you, if you give off your bread to the poor and disperse to the needy, living like Jesus, speaking words of kindness and love, and living honestly and uprightly in the world, he will say, Well, I thought the Bible was all hypocrisy, but I cannot think so now, because there is Mr. So-and-so. See how he lives. I could believe my infidelity if it were not for him. The Bible certainly has an effect upon his life, and therefore I must believe it. And then, how many souls may be converted by what some men are privileged to write and print? There is Dr. Doddridge, Rise and Progress of Religion. Though I decidedly object to some things in it, I could wish that everybody laud read that book. So many have been the conversion it has produced. I think it more honor to have written Watts' Psalms and Hymns than Milton's Paradise Lost, and more glory to have written that book of old Wilcox, A Drop of Honey, or the track that God has used so much, The Sinner's Friend, than all the books of Homer. I value for the good they may do to men's souls, much as I respect the genius Pope or Dryden or Burns. Give me the simple lines of copper that God has owned in bringing souls to him. Oh, to think that we may write and print books which shall reach poor sinners' heart. The other day my soul was gladdened exceedingly by invitation from a pious woman to go and see her. She told me she had been ten years on her bed and not had been able to steer from it. Nine years, she said. I was dark and blind and unthinking, but my husband brought me one of your sermons. I read it and glad God bless it with the opening of my eyes. He converted my soul with it, and now all glory to him. I love his name. Each Sabbath morning, she said, I wait for your sermon. I live on it all the week as marrow and fatness to my spirit. Ah, thought I. There is something to cheer the printers and all of us who labor in that good work. One good brother wrote to me this week, Brother Spurgeon, keep your courage up. You are known in multitudes of households of England, and you are loved too, though we cannot hear you or see your living form. Yet throughout our village, your sermons are scattered, and I know of cases of conversion from them. More than I can tell you, another friend mentioned to me an instance of a clergyman of the Church of England, a canon of cathedral, who frequently preaches the sermon on Sabbath, whether in the cathedral or not. I cannot say 
but I hope he does. Who can tell when the things are printed what hearts they may reach, what good they may affect. Words that I spoke three weeks ago, eyes are now perus perusing while tears are gushing from them as they read. Glory be to God most high. But after all, preaching is the ordained means for the salvation of sinners. And by this ten times, as many are brought to the Savior as by any other. Ah, my friends, to have been the means of saving souls from death by preaching, what an honor. There is a young man who has not long commenced his minister career. When he enters the pulpits, everybody notices what deep solemnity there is upon him. Beyond his ears, his face is white and blanched by an unearthly solemn. His body is shriveled by his labor. Constant study and midnight lamp have worn him away. But when he speaks, he utters wondrous words that lift the soul up to heaven. And the aged saints well never did I go as near to heaven as when I listen to his voice. There comes in some gay young woman who listens and criticizes his aspect. He thinks it as by no means such as to be desired, but he listens. One thought strike him, then another. See you that men. He has been moral all his life long, but he has never been renewed. Now tear begun to flow down his cheek. Just put your ear against his breast, and you will hear him groan out. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. A uh, good reward for a withered frame or a ruined constitution. Or take another case. A man is preaching the word of God. He is standing up to deliver his master's message. And it steals some poor harlot. Such a case. I knew not long ago. A poor harlot determined she would go and take her life on Black Friars Bridge. Passing by these doors one Sunday night. She thought she would step in and for the last time hear something that might prepare her to stand before her maker. She forced herself into the aisle and she could not escape until I rose from the pulpit. The text was, See though this woman, I dwelt upon Mary Magdalene and her sins her washing the Savior's feet with her tears and wiping them with the hair of her head. There stood the woman, melted away with the thought that she should hear herself described and her own life painted. Oh, to think of saving a poor harlot from death to deliver such a one man from going down to the grave. And then, as God please, to save her soul from going down to hell. Is it not worth 10,000 lives if we could sacrifice them all on the altar of God? When I thought of this text yesterday, I could only weep to think that God should have favor me. O oh, men and women, how can you better spend your time and wealth than in the cause of the Redeemer? What holier enterprise can you engage in this sacred one of saving souls from death and hiding a multitude of sins? This is a wealth that you can take with you, the wealth 
that has been acquired under God by having saved souls from death and covered a multitude of sins. I know there are some now before the throne who first wept the penitential tears in this house of prayer and who thank God that they had listened to this voice and methinks they have a tender and affectionate love still for whom God honored us, minister of the gospel, if you on earth are privileged to win souls, I think when you die, those spirits will rejoice to be your guardian angels. They will say, Father, that man is dying whom we love. May we go and watch him. Yeah, said God. You may go and carry heaven with you. Down come the spirit, ministering angels, and oh, how lovingly they look on us. They would, if they could, strike out the furrow from the forehead and take the cold clammy sweat with their own blessed hands away. They must not do it. But oh, how tenderly they watch that suffering man who was made the means of doing good to their souls. And when he opened his eyes to immortality, he shall see them like guards around his bed and hear them say, Come with us, thrice welcome, honored servant of God, come with us. And when he speed his way upwards toward heaven on strong wings of faith, these spirits who stand by him will clap their wings behind him, and he will enter heaven with many crowns upon his head each of which he will delight to cast at the feet of Jesus. O brethren, if you turn a sinner from the error of his way, remember you have saved a soul from that and hidden a multitude of sins. The application, I can only just mention it is this, that he who is the means of the conversion of a sinner does, under God, save soul from death and by the multitude of sins. But particular attention ought to be paid to backsliders. For in bringing backsliders into the church, there is as much honor to God as in bringing in sinners. Brethren, if any of you do ear from the truth and one convert him, alas, the poor backslider is often the most forgotten. A member of the church has disgraced his profession. The church excommunicated him and he was accounted a heathen man and a publican. I know of men of good standing in the gospel ministry, who ten years ago fell into sin, and that is thrown in our teeth to this very day. Do you speak of them? You are at once informed why ten years ago they did so and so. Brethren, Christian men ought to be ashamed of themselves for taking notice of such things so long afterwards. True, we may use more caution in our dealings, but to reproach a fallen brother for what he did so long ago is contrary to the spirit of John, who went after Peter three days after he had denied his master with oaths and curses. Nowadays, it is the fashion, if a man falls, to have nothing to do with him. Men say, he is a bad fellow, 
we will not go after him. Beloved, suppose he is the worst. Is not that the reason why you should go most after him? Suppose he never was a child of God. Suppose he never knew the truth. Is not that the greater reason why you should go after him? I do not understand your malkish modesty, your excessive pride. That won't let you after the chip of sinners. The worse the case, the more is the reason why we should go. But suppose the man is a child of God and you have cast him off. Remember, he is your brother. He is one with Christ as much as you are. He is justified. He has the same righteousness that you have. And if, when he has sinned, despise him, in that you despise him, you despise his master. Take heed, though thyself may be tempted, and may one day fall like David, thou may walk on the top of thine house rather too high. And thou may see something which shall bring thee to sin. Then what will thou say if then the brethren pass thee with a sneer and take no notice of thee? Oh, if we have one backslider connected with our church, let us take special care of him. Don't deal hardly with him. Recollect you would have been a backslider too, if it were not for the grace of God. I advise you, whenever you see professors living in sin, to be very shy of them. But if after a time you see any sign of repentance, or if you do not, go and seek the lost sheep of the house of Israel. For remember, that if one of you do ear from the truth and one convert him, let him remember that he who convert the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. Backsliders, who your minis- misery feel, I will come after you one moment. Poor backslider, thou was once a Christian, does thou people hope thou was? No, say thou. I believe I deceive myself and others. I was no child of God. Well, if thou did, let me tell thee that if thou will acknowledge that God will forgive thee, Suppose you did deceive the church, thou art not the first that did it. There are some members of this church, I fear, who have done so, and we have not found them out. I tell you your case is not hopeless. That is not the unpardonable sin. Some who have tried to deceive the very elect have yet been delivered. And my master says he is able to save the uttermost. And you have not gone beyond the uttermost. All who come unto him, come thou then to his feet. Cast thyself on mercy. And thou did once enter his came as a spy, he will not hang thee up for it, but will be glad to get thee. Anyhow, as a trophy of mercy. But if thou was a child of God, and can say honestly, I know I did love him, and he loved me. I tell thee, he loved thee still. If thou hast gone ever so far astray, thou art as much his child as ever. 
Though thou hast run away from thy father, come back, come back. He is thy father still. Think not he has unsheathed the word to the lady. Say not, he has cast me out of the family. He has not. His bowels yearn over thee now. My father loves thee. Come then to his feet, and he will not even remind thee of what thou hast done. The prodigal was going to tell his father all his sins, and to ask him to make him one of his hired servants. But the father stopped his mouth. He let him say that he was not worthy to be called his son. But he would not let him say, Make me as an hired servant. Come back and thy father will receive thee gladly. He will put his arms around thee and kiss thee with the kisses of his love. And he will say, I have found this, my son, that was lost. I have recovered this ship that had gone astray. My father loved thee without works. He justified thee irrespective of them. Thou hast no less merit now than thou had them. Come and trust and believe in him. Lastly, you who believe you are not backsliders, if you are saved, remember that a soul is saved from death and a multitude of sins hidden. O oh, my friends, if I might but be a hundred-handed man to cut you all, I would love to be so. If aught I could say could win your souls, if by preaching here from now till midnight, I might by any possibility capture some of you to the love of the Savior. I would do it. Some of you are speeding your way to hell blindfolded. My hearers, I do not deceive you. You are going to perdition as fast as time can carry you. Some of you are deceiving yourselves with the thought that you are righteous and you are not so. Many of you who had solemn warnings and have never been moved by them, you have admired the way in which the warning has been given, but the thing itself has never entered your heart. Hundreds of you are without God and without Christ, strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. And may not I plead with you, is a gloomy religious system to hold me captive and never let me speak. Why, poor hearts, do you know your sad condition? Do you know that God is angry with the wicked every day? That the way of transgressor is hard? That he that believe not is condemned already? Has it never been told you that he that believe not shall be damned? And can you stand damnation? My hearer, could you make your bed in hell? Could you lie down in the pit? Do you think it would be an easy portion for your souls to be rocked on waves of flame forever and to be tossed about with the demons in the place where hope cannot come? You may smile now, but will not smile soon. God sends me an ambassador now. But if you listen not to me, he will not send him an ambassador next time, but an executioner. There will be no wooing words of mercy soon. The only exhortation, though will heal, will be dull, cold voice of death. Come with me, then thou will not be in the place 
where we sing God's praises and where righteous prayers are daily offered. The only music that would hear will be the sigh of them, the shriek of fiends, and the yellings of the tormented. Oh, may God in His mercy snatch you as brands from the fires to be trophies of His grace throughout eternity. The way to be saved is to renounce thy works and ways with grief and fly to Jesus. And if now thou art a conscience chicken sinner, that is all I want. If thou will confess that thou art a sinner, that is all God requires of thee. And even that he gives thee, Jesus Christ says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you hear his wooing words? Will you turn from his wit looks of mercy? Has his cross no influence? Have his wounds no power to bring you to his feet? Ah, then, what can I say? The arm of the Spirit, which is mightier than men, alone can make hard her hearts melt and blow stubborn wills to the ground. Sinners, if you confess your sin this morning, there is a Christ for you. You need not stay. Oh, that I knew where to find him. The word is nigh thee, on thy lips and in thy hearts. If thou wilt with thine heart believe, and with thy mouth confess, the Lord Jesus, thou shalt be saved for. He that believe and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believe not shall be damned.